In construction, we have all kinds of engineers. Structural engineers, civil engineers, geotechnical engineers, acoustical engineers, mechanical engineers. Today we're talking with a structural engineer. This is Jason Powers with ZFA Structural Engineers. And we're going to be talking about what a structural engineer does, why we need to hire one, especially if we're building a home or planning on working on our home. Let's take it away. So Jason, thanks for joining us today. And we're really excited because actually structural engineer is an incredibly important part of what we do on a day-by-day -day basis. And if we don't have a good structural engineer as a partner on these projects, they become really complicated to build, expensive to build, and labor intensive to build. And so what we really try to make sure is we're looking at structural engineers and structural engineering that works for us, the builders, as well as the client. Because if we can develop a project that is cost effective to build, but still has the same architectural design as a, uh, as a architect has decided, then we are giving the client the best bang for their buck. So tell me a little bit about the work process of a structural engineer. Right on. Thanks for having me, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, the work process starts with uh, start with understanding the, really the constraints and the goals of the project. So that's uh, I call this warming up the oven because before we really get into design and calculations and producing drawings, um, you got to turn turn that on oven on and let it warm up to till it's like 350 before you put the put the muffins in. Okay. So warming up the oven for us means understanding the constraints of the project, the goals, the budgetary um, goals of the project. So you actually take into consideration the budget from the very beginning? Yes, for sure. Even okay. right from the proposal process oftentimes. Okay. Yeah. And is that to uh, help the architect understand the constraints of, so if, if they've developed this really complex project that's going to involve, say, a lot of steel, that you're going to have to add a lot of steel to that project. And if the architect wants to make small tweaks here and there, then you have that opportunity to kind of work with them to get the budget down. Exactly. And the earlier and the sooner in the process that we do that, the better, right? It's, it ends up being a bit of an iterative process to get to the ultimate goals and meet that and make that project successful. And so the sooner that we can sort of identify and start zeroing in on, on the budget and uh, combine, combining that with the architectural goals, it's the better. We just keep on keep on a narrow track towards the goal okay. as much as possible, and we really appreciate having a, having a general contractor on board um, early on to help inform that process because this is a team effort. Right. So I think what's really important to understand is that the structural engineer and the architect and the builder all work together to develop the budget of the project. So the architect and the structural engineer aren't kind of dealing with the electrical, sorry, the the framers or the structural steel guys on a continuous basis. And so they don't really understand where the pricing is on all of these things. And so when we interact with them and give them pricing for options, that informs their decisions on the most cost effective way to do things. Now, tell me the difference between say a structural engineer and a civil engineer. And then there's also a geotechnical engineer, which we see all the time. Like, how does your job differ or work with those types of engineers? Indeed, it does feel like there's a lot of engineers <laughs> in those projects. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so structural, we definitely focus on the structural, the uh, <laughs> the the building systems and the and the elements and the uh, materials that form the backbone of the architectural structure. Geotechnical engineers, they focus on the soil. They analyze, study um, the soil before we even begin design, send that to a lab, get the results. So they're the ones that are doing the boring. So drilling down with a hollow pipe into the ground and getting that what we call a core sample. And then they're the ones that are sending that to the lab. And then what does the lab give them? And then what is their job? Like the lab is not the soils engineer. The lab is actually a different company, right? Yeah, sometimes they have them in-house, but okay. oftentimes it's outside. So they that lab basically gives them the detailed analysis of the different soil strata that they come across, that they get, that they gather through those borings that you mentioned. Okay. Um, and then the geotech interprets that, that data coming back to them, 
puts together the report. Ultimately, they're try we're trying to tune the foundation with the soil type for that particular house in that particular location. And, and it's crucial that we have that geotechnical information to work because ultimately, uh, eventually they'll use their analysis and in the report, they'll tell us the best, they'll recommend the best type of foundation for that type of soil. And then we go ahead and design that foundation. Okay, so then when the geotech gets that project, they actually already have kind of the general layout of the project on that site. And then they're picking drilling sites that are most kind of uh, important for that structure. And then they're looking at what they think the, f the soil underneath will bear for that project. Yes, oh. ideally they would know the project more or less in place so they can pick those spots to do those boring, the borings in, in the places where if there's a main house here, a detached garage here, maybe a pool house over here, they will actually take those borings in those locations. So we have as exact information as possible. Okay, so then what are they looking for? Like, uh, is it just bearing capacity or is there like, I know that we've seen some uh, information about landslides in some projects that, that restricted us from building in specific areas. So what is the geotech looking for in order to inform you to make the structural engineering designs? I think bearing is the most fundamental key, very important, but it's probably the most fundamental aspect for the getting al the allowable bearing pressure. Um, so that just means the weight of the building sitting on the ground. Exactly. Okay. And then great. they give us this, this allowable weight that the soil can handle at a certain depth. Um, and uh, then we design the foundation to that. But otherwise, they're looking at where is that good, good layer of soil that we want to go. Sometimes it's shallow. It's just a f foot or two beneath the surface. And sometimes it's 20 feet below. We have to use different types of foundations to basically access and uh, oh. tap into the uh, the layers that are best the, that are best to support that the given structure. Okay, yeah. so then you're coming in. You you've got this report from the civil engineer or the soils engineer, the geotechnical engineer, and they're saying, okay, you need to use this type of foundation for this project. And then you take that information and do you start with the foundation? Or do you start at a different place when you're looking at a specific design from an architect? Yeah, good question. And typically, we start from the top, generally speaking, gather the loads, do the design, and then we really need to design um, the primary systems of the superstructure, which is the house um, above grade, uh, to gather those loads, which then inform the foundation design. So uh, you and I understand the word loads, but maybe the, the general audience doesn't understand that. What does that mean? when you say gather the loads and you start from the top. Like mm -hmm. it, that seems kind of counterintuitive to start from the top and go down. Because you build it the opposite. Way. Yeah, because exactly <laughs> right, right? Yeah. So like, what does that mean to start from the top and then gather the loads? Like, can you explain that to me? Sure, the two main loads that we that we really designed for are gravity loads. Um, so that's just the weight of things. It is, exactly. Okay. It's needs and that's air. directly down generally, and right? It's vertical, okay. uh, it's exactly down. And then there's uh, lateral loads, which can include seismic or wind loads, and that's left to right or horizontal. So in simple terms, they're up-down loads and side-to-side -side loads. Okay. And so those are the loads we're taking into account as we as we take those loads designed for the structure from the roof down through the floor, the walls, the floors, all the way down to the foundation. All that has to culminate and land on a foundation and then that foundation needs to be designed to adequately support all those loads. Okay, so um, things like posts and, fr and like wall framing uh, and things like that, and actually beams over openings. So a, a member, a, like a steel beam or a wood beam over an opening would catch loads, vertical loads, right? Yeah. So that, I think a lot of people are gonna understand that. But what do you mean by horizontal loads and wind loads and how do you, how do you counteract those loads in a, in a structure? So those are what we call lateral resisting elements. And those elements are, um, we basically push on from the side. Let's say a shear wall, a wood shear wall. We push on it and it wants to slide and rock. And so we designed to these shear walls to resist those forces coming from the side. And those are initiated through wind or earthquakes. So what is a shear wall? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> a shear wall is a, um, 
is basically a stud wall, like like you would see in any. any so just a framed two by four, two by six wall. Yes, okay. exactly. Maybe at 16 inches on center, but with the added details of um, very deliberate of of plywood, structural plywood, on okay. the, attached to the side of the studs, with a specific nailing pattern around it, and also what we call end posts, which are two sort of larger posts at each end of this shear wall, which are then attached to mechanical fasteners we call hold downs, which are then. Um, attached to the foundation. So they're actually a big bolt stuck yes. in the ground, uh, or not in the ground, in the concrete foundation. Yeah. And then it has rebar around it and concrete around it so it doesn't pull out. And then that is attached to what is a, essentially a big metal hardware called a hold down, which is then bolted to the, the two big posts at the end. At each end, yeah, okay. exactly. So then um, we'll talk a little bit more on subsequent videos about kind of the dynamics of a shear wall, mm -hmm. but in general, the shear wall is only good in one dimension, right? It's only like if a shear wall is this, it's only good in forces that go exactly. along the length of that shear wall. Yes. But it's not good in forces that would turn it over, right? Right. So what do you do in that respect? Like do you have more shear walls going in different directions? Yeah, we really, um, in simple terms, we design them for both directions. One going, one for each house or each structure. You have shear walls that support the lateral movement in one direction and then the uh, 90 degrees the other direction. Okay, yep. so what happens in houses? So we do a lot of modern construction and in those modern constructions, we have a lot of big window openings. Um, and those big window openings don't really have spaces for shear walls often. So how do you deal with that if you don't have the space for a shear wall? Usually the first option we look at is steering something, another element that can do a similar, have the similar effect as a wood shear wall, but in a different way as we use a steel moment frame. It's usually the first thing that we consider in those sort of wide open situations. And that's, uh, that's using the strengths of steel where you can weld a column to a beam, make that a rigid connection, and then it provides that same sort of lateral rigidity um, to support to support the, s those lateral forces that we're designing for, but yet allows for a big opening that okay. oftentimes these structures are looking for. So then how come mm. we would not always just use those moment frames? Uh, they're more expensive, okay. typically, okay. than a wood shear wall. So your wood shear wall is usually your least expensive seismic resisting element. Okay. So can a structural engineer um, do the same work as an architect? Can they design the structures or, or actually, can an architect do the same work as a structural engineer? From what I've read, they used to be able to back in the Frank Lloyd Wright days. I believe <laughs> the architects did a lot of structural engineering then, but these days, as is common in our society in general, is there's specializations okay. and things are becoming become so specialized, code has become quite complicated. So we all have our specialties, which makes it all the more important for us to work together okay. and communicate well. Okay. Yeah. So architects really can't, I'm sorry, architects really can't design not many. Some understand it better than others at right. this point, but right. most uh, do not feel comfortable design, doing this stru specific structural design. Okay. Yeah. So then really it's important for us to uh, bring a structural engineer on whenever we're doing something that can kind of affect life and safety or the structure of a building. Indeed, that's our basic you know, our basic tenant and goal on every project is to meet code minimum, which is really performance goal of life safety. Okay. Given, given an earthquake or strong wind loads. Yeah. Okay. And so when you, uh, when you go out to look at a project, like how are you uh, kind of approaching that whole project from a structural standpoint? Are you, so you said you started from the top down, you went into the foundation, but that's really like a new house, right? Like how would you go into that same kind of conversation or, or t trip to a project that maybe is just, um, modifying a roof or uh, talking about an addition, like how do you address the existing structure? Because the existing structure is probably not built to the current code. Yeah, indeed. Oh, well, that's a good question. So um, I think primarily there's so many different types of um, projects, even within the custom residential world that we, we work, live and work in, that my first, my first goal when I'm approaching a new project is really understanding what are the what does this project need what is it looking for is it yeah. looking for a holistic remodel with an addition or is it just looking to work in this one particular area and i usually like want to start there with like what the goals are what the budget is again of the particular owner and then we go from there so the designing from the top down is the simple concepts got but it. i feel like even more important is really understanding what this project needs got it and everyone's a little different usually okay yeah. so what's the hardest part of your job 
Oh, uh, keeping up with emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I think the hardest part of all of our jobs, right? <laughs> So what's the what's the best part of your job? Uh, you know, I really enjoy interacting and coordinating with the team, both yeah. external and, and internal. I've got a great team. Love working with them. Problem solving, problem solving the different projects that are yeah. coming our way, um, and working with people like you to like, to identify what this project needs. Got it. And that's one of our, our greatest strengths. I feel like for where we're coming from is is really figuring that out. And then that's our focus. We don't just it's not just a one size one answer fits all. Got it. Kind of. A, so yeah. I, I have to say that when I asked you the what's your least favorite part of your job or the hardest part of your job, I thought you were definitely going to say dealing with the building departments and all the comments <laughs> from the building departments because uh, we have, you know, every structural engineer in California, it seems like, has uh, challenges with different building departments because every building department requires a different thing and they all ask different questions and it's just incredibly difficult to, because in the Bay Area, like where we live and work, I mean, we have maybe 18 or 20 different jurisdictions, each of which have their own set of rules that the structural engineers and the architects have to deal with. I, I just don't understand how you guys do it all the time and still have a smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, fortunately, I got a team to help me with that. But I feel like we've done so many of them. We've just gotten used to it. It's part of the process. And generally, I've also found that there are real people behind those plan check comments and oftentimes you can just call them and talk through it and get a better understanding of what are you really asking what are you looking for here this is what we were thinking and then responding that can help expedite that process so it's it's you know it's all engineering and so it's a lot of numbers and calculations and stuff mm -hmm. but it also just really comes to relationships right really mm -hmm. trying to understand what the other team needs, whether it's the team at the building department or the architectural team or the builder's team. Yeah, hundred percent. That's if you, awesome. If you can't work through that process, it's going to be a tough job. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, so I think what we've really tried to focus on this meeting is just understanding what a structural engineer is. In subsequent videos, we're going to be talking about different project types and also about uh, value engineering, about the, the structural engineering with respect to foundations and framing. So if you're interested in learning more about building science or just following our projects or having other, other conversations like this, please hit subscribe and we'll talk to you soon.